And uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I hope you guys all had a good first day and a good dinner. It's hard to always talk after people eat, but like Linda said, I hope you drank some caffeine. You can eat the good chocolate. Maybe that'll keep you up. Um, so uh, a little bit about uh, me, and then I'm going to ask you guys a few questions. Um, so um, I did go to business school on the East Coast. They didn't let me in here, or I would have come. Um, <laughs> spent a few years at Microsoft. Uh, it was fun. Then I came here, and I was a full-time uh, general partner at Kleiner Perkins for over a decade, and uh, led, I don't know, 20 some odd uh, uh, deals there. And then um, a few years ago, I decided to sort of phase out of that. So now I'm doing a variety of things. I teach a class here, uh, of which some of these slides will be uh, directly from the curriculum. Uh, and I uh, still on a few client boards and um, do a lot of angel investing. I've invested in 13 startups uh, of my own money over the last few years. Um, I also serve on a few nonprofit boards. So that's me. So uh, obviously, I don't, I'm not going to get to know all of you at this level of detail. But at some level of detail, I am kind of curious. So um, show of hands, how many people have been more than five years removed from, from GSP? We have some students graduating across the street, too. Ah, OK. Uh, and how many have either started a business before or after business school? How many want to start a business now? Right? Yeah. That gives me a little sense. I, I'm not, not that surprised by that showing of hands. <laughs> All right, so I was asked to talk about this topic, evaluating a business idea. And um, having been both a general manager and a vice president at Microsoft, we thought about evaluating businesses one way. And then as an institutional venture capitalist, another way. And now as an angel investor, yet another way, although I've never been an entrepreneur per se. And so I had to think twice before I really, because I've never really done a presentation on this topic specifically. So I had to think a couple of times about it. And the question that came to mind is, you know, how do you judge a business idea? And, you know, there's some sort of standard tricks of the trade and we'll talk about them. But I got I wanted to get more fundamental. I mean, how do you, how do you decide on what metrics to judge a business? And I thought, you know, a similar question in some regards is how do you know you're happy? It's a very personal decision. And everybody has a different set of what I call ways to measure what happiness or, you know, what a successful business idea is. So I want to start this by, you know, kind of going a little out of the box for a second because I think a lot of you probably came to this thinking, you know, hey, this guy's a venture capitalist. He's going to give us, you know, some, like, market sizing, you know, multiples, how exciting the business opportunity is, and we'll get to that. But I think I want to start by saying, you know, most businesses, 99.9% .9 of all businesses that get started in the world, but certainly even in the United States, are not venture capital funded businesses. So I think I want to sort of draw a little, cast a wider net when we think about this topic. So here's my, my way of thinking about this, and this is not, this is no science, you won't read this in a textbook, but I put up a bunch of possible outcomes just to give you some food for thought when you think about evaluating a business. Um, and, you know, some people are very satisfied to run what I call lifestyle businesses. You know, um, they throw off a lot of cash. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them do. They're never going to go public. They're never going to get a great multiple. They're never going to get venture capitalists excited. But they're perfectly good businesses. Um, you know? It used to be, maybe not lately, but a long time ago, the richest people in your town were the people who owned the car dealerships. Those are great lifestyle businesses, right? They just threw off cash. You know, you had a franchise. You were really not threatened. Now, obviously, it didn't last forever. But, um, but for many years, that was a great business to own. Um, another kind of idea, you know, for some people is actually to go into the social service sector or the nonprofit sector. And they're not going to be measured on profits. They may not be measured on growth. They might be measured on social impact. You know, and more and more, like I actually was at this institution today as a um, guest in a case for a GSB class uh, about a nonprofit that I'm the board chair of. And one of the points I made to the class as a guest was the, the case was about should this nonprofit grow or not. And I said, growth in nonprofits 
in certain sectors of the nonprofit world are you have to think about it differently than businesses. They, their growth should not be measured by revenues or people or profits. It's certainly a profit. It should be measured on can they grow their impact. You know. So again, I don't know what your your measure is for success, but I want you to think. You know, it's not just the lack. You know, in the, in, in the Silicon Valley kind of milieu, everybody thinks that you know what you want to do when you start a company is, um, you know, raise venture capital and shoot to the moon. And you know what? Once in a while that happens. Most times it does not. So I found this cartoon that I think sort of speaks to this theme. Um, Gilbert's Night, my favorite cartoons by far. So this is Dogbert in his usual consulting mode. And he says, you can revive the entrepreneurial spirit here by reminding people of the early years. He points to a picture. He says, your founders were two bums who began in a cardboard box. And then he says, one bum misdialed his bookie and accidentally bought Cisco stock at the IPO. <laughs> now, not what you would consider a traditional success story, but maybe for some people this might be a success story. <laughs> now, and by the way, if you can do that, actually, good, good for you. Most people can't do that. But I, again, the spirit of this is, I think, you have to measure your own success metrics. And just because you're in the valley and like there's so many people who have left Stanford and started places like Google, good for them, but it's not for everybody. And most times, that's not the, the story that people are going to get measured by. So now, um, kind of where I'll go for the next bunch of slides here is to talk about kind of some of the tricks of the trade, as I mentioned earlier, that people use to evaluate business opportunities. Now, one that you probably learned if you're a graduate of this place is this idea of um, five forces. Um, even I was taught when I was in business school a long time ago this thing. It's good. You know, people still use it. I, I mean, I think consultants still use it. But to be honest with you, when it comes to using this tool for evaluating entrepreneurial opportunities, that's not very it's not very useful. Because if you look at these things, you know, you're supposed to know like who the suppliers and how powerful they're going to be and what the substitutes are. When you're when you're using when you're thinking about a startup opportunity, none of these things exist. It's you know, usually. Now you know, you could be a late entrant, some of this might be present. But for the most part, you know, a frame like this, a framework like this, while it's great in in, in evaluating businesses that operate in industry sectors that are well understood, for most startups, certainly the kind that I look at as an investor, both institutionally and as an angel investor, this doesn't really help you very much. So you can think about it. You can, you know, think about where you might end up if the company is successful. But most of this doesn't really make any sense for startups um, at the beginning. So another important thing to think about, um, you know, and again, a very typical kind of thing that people sort of teach people when they're thinking about evaluating business opportunities is the strength of the team. I mean, because you don't know about the future, but you know what's here today. It's often the team, the starting team. And one thing they teach a lot, um, I think, these days, it, it wasn't as big a deal, actually, when, when I went through business school, is this idea of um, entrepreneur authenticity. What does that mean? I put it in quotes because I'm not really sure everybody kind of use it the same way. But I, I, think, I think the notion is that people who have, uh, who are starting these companies, if they have real world experience, knowledge, um, if they've internalized the problem in a we way that's really authentic, that's, that's, that's an interesting place to start an evaluation of a, of a business opportunity. In other words, you know, how, how, does, how does the problem come to manifest itself? How does the opportunity to manifest itself? It usually comes from the entrepreneur. I was actually talking to her at, 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 at dinner. It doesn't mean you have to have lived in the industry that you want to start the company. What it means is that you have internalized the problem. You've become an expert to the degree that you can credibly and authentically talk about the problem and the solution you're, you're providing. So I think that is a place to start. But it's, 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 it has to be augmented often by sort of the idea of, the team. Who else can you recruit? What other advisors or team members have been accreted by the, by the team? And then I think the last thing is probably equally important to me anyway. One of the things I look at when I think about evaluating a business idea is um, you know, what motivates the team. And I'll tell you, we have this thing at Kleiner, and I think a lot of venture capitalists have this, is that um, you sometimes would have a team come in 
and they'd be, you know, doing their presentation. And within, you know, a few slides, you know, the whole idea of selling the company and what the returns were going to be. I mean, look, everybody knows that investors are in it for some kind of return. But there's a certain kind of presentation, a certain kind of entrepreneur that really comes on with the sort of um, mentality that it's, it's all about making money. And that really turned me off. And it really typically turns off like Klein or other, a lot of other institutional venture capitalists. Because um, that kind of mentality, it, um, it, it doesn't speak to the staying power and the passion of the entrepreneurs. What really sort of, I think, is the thing that when you're looking at a founding team that you really, really get excited about, it's what motivates them is usually the mission. Their passion for the idea, their passion for the, you know, the, what the product or the service is going to do. Not necessarily what the outcome. Now, everybody wants a good financial outcome, but that's, that's sort of a um, byproduct. What really motivates and really what, what a really great entrepreneurial opportunity looks like, typically, is a very passionate, motivated team. So that's certainly, in terms of evaluating opportunities, that, that's where one of the places I start. Now, another thing a lot of people will have you think about when you think about evaluating opportunities for startups is, you know, what trends are coming along that, um, you know, you can ride? It, it, certainly, a lot of um, businesses, especially in the technology area, do get um, sort of successful or maybe sometimes not successful because they ride these waves. So I just listed a few of them. I mean, there, there's some that are obvious that, that rise you know, all boats or, or sinks all boats, which is sort of the macroeconomic things, you know, recessions, inflation. But there are much more interesting ones to look at, like technology disruption, like like these platforms like the iPhone that come along. You know, before you know it, you have like 10 million people using a device they didn't use a few years ago. That's an interesting thing as a startup to think hard about. How do you parlay that into some advantage? How do you take advantage of that? Um, I think the stuff that's going on in healthcare reform right now, there, is going, there are going to be so many opportunities around that that we've yet to understand. And I know, I'm sure, that people in the health services area, investors and entrepreneurs, are already starting to sit those out. So at any one time, any of these trends could be you know, really real and, and, and important to start businesses. But you have to be careful because some of them can be um, ephemeral. They can come and go. Like, you know, aging, for example. Aging is a real, a real trend, and a lot of people have been trying to build businesses around aging um, for a long time. I first got to Kleiner, you know, four, 13, 14 years ago, I started seeing some of those plans. Here we are 14 years later. I'm not sure that that was a trend bet on 14 years ago. Maybe it is now, but, you know, timing is very relevant to startups. And so these trends, sometimes, you know, the timing of them is not always obvious. So another sort of dimension when you think about evaluating these opportunities and, and evaluating any one opportunity is innovation. And you know, again, this is just kind of the, the landscape. Um, and it, it's hard to kind of pin down what innovation is, but I, I sort of tried to sort of create a couple of buckets here. Um, one, one that the kind of venture capitalist that I was, um, and, and still am to some degree as an angel, is, is this first bucket is you know, build a better mousetrap, you know, a product innovation. And they come in the venture world, there's sort of two different kinds that people talk about. One is brave new world, and the other is better, faster, cheaper. Better, faster, cheaper is kind of easy to understand. It's basically, there's a product already in the market. The team comes in and says, hey, I've got a better way to build it either faster, cheaper. You know, it's a different kind of investment, typically. You know, it's not a home run, but you can often make pretty good money doing that. A lot of the, the team's authenticity and knowledge comes to bear, right? Because they sort of say, I know exactly what the current product in the market is and how we're going to build something better. So plenty of investments have, done, have been done on that sort of theme. But the ones that most people like, particularly the big institutional venture capitalists, um, are the brave new world ones. And I think this is kind of the ones that I think a lot of young entrepreneurs that, that come out of places like Stanford like to think you know, groundbreaking, something, you know, way new product comes out of a lab at Stanford or, or comes out of some research that, that, that the entrepreneur is working on. can be very exciting. They also have different risk-reward trade-offs, right? I mean, the brave new world ones often work a lot less than the better, faster, cheaper ones. 
but sometimes the ones that, the Brave New World ones that do work, have much more upside. So different kinds of innovation. Then there's business model innovation, and I think this is pretty interesting because, you know, Google, Google's an interesting example. You know, people, I don't, I don't actually know what the sort of traditional wisdom is about, about Google, but we were investors in Google. I helped do the diligence on Google, I went to the first bunch of board meetings. And I, I don't know, do people think that Google, I was just show of hands, do you think Google is an innovative company or not? Maybe yet, people think yes, innovative. Okay. Do you think what was innovative was their technology? Their, their business, was, their technology was innovative? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would argue otherwise. I would argue otherwise. And, and I'll tell you why, because I think, yeah, they, they, they had a better algorithm for ranking, for ranking pages on the internet. I'm not really sure that's why users use that. It's there, certainly in the early days. I think what they used it for was because it was more complete and it was faster. And it was a simpler UI. And those things were, you know, I mean, I don't know if that was huge innovation, but where I think the big innovation was, they, and I'm not sure they understood this in the early days, but what, the reason Google is so super successful, if you read all these cases about people who've analyzed it, is they got a network effect going by getting more users, and therefore the advertisers became more effective. And when that happened, more users came, and when that happened, more advertisers came, and so forth. That network effect was not obvious in the early days. In fact, there were no advertisers when we invested. There was zero revenue. We invested just because on the traffic growth. But in fact, I would claim that Google's biggest innovation, I'm sure someone in the world might challenge me and have better data, but I think their biggest innovation, in a sense, was creating this network effect around advertisers and search, which there had been lots of search companies before that. You know, there was actually, when we invested in Google, there was like five or six. But none of them had got that flywheel going of advertisers and users in that sort of tight loop that Google still, even now, Microsoft's poor hundreds of millions of dollars to try to, you know, you know, eat away at, at Google's market share. And they still can because they still have that network effect going. So I think one of the things that's sort of maybe a little bit underappreciated is finding opportunities out there that, you know, they have some innovation on the product or the technology side, but a lot of interesting businesses get built around, you know, building these network effects, eBay. People don't realize Microsoft Windows is one of the really big network effects. Um, uh, success story. The network effect there was once you've trained all your people to use Windows and Windows applications, it's really hard to switch them. So they basically, and even now, I mean, I don't know that a lot of people, corporations love Windows, and they don't certainly don't like the price, but they keep buying it because all their, all their training manuals, all their applications, I mean, they're all sort of stuck in that network effect. So this is, I think, underappreciated, and a lot of times people, particularly out of institutions like this, I see, they want to start a company, the first thing they want to tell me about is like the product and the technology. And that, that's interesting, but I think a lot of times I look at sort of a business model innovation as well. Um, and then there's just business execution. You know, Dell figured out a way to sell computers without retailers. That was cool, and now they have retail. But, but you know, and Walmart figured out a way to have a better distribution chain with lower costs. And, so um, those are some, some general themes. Um, now I'm going to kind of go more specifically into if you have a specific idea, you know, what are some of the rules of thumb? Um, and, and here's where, I, I, this is a little bit more kind of where um, you would see venture capitalists or institutional investors sort of thinking this, you know, along these lines. One of the things they look for a lot is this idea between product and market fit. They teach that a lot now in business schools. I think there's a whole class here about this. And the whole idea is, you know, there's lots of latent market needs out there. How do you build a product that really, you know, feeds right into it and sort of drives that kind of, um, you know, excitement and, and, and fulfillment from the customer? That's a, a, a big thing and, and understanding that fit and, sort of how the entrepreneurs see that fit and what testing you can do early in your product life cycle to sort of prove to yourself as an entrepreneur and to the investors that there is a tight linkage between the need and the product or service you're offering. That's one of like the probably fundamental things that you have to look for when you're evaluating a, a, a startup opportunity. Um, market size is obviously a big deal. Um, I put sort of the rule of thumb that venture capitalists look for. You know, they typically, and again, it's changed, but, you know, I still rule of thumb. They like sort of a company that can get to $100 million of revenue, 
and that and 20% market share that implies a kind of at least a 500 million dollar market, and of course lots of growth. Typically, you want to get in before there isn't a 500 million dollar market, and you want to grow as it you know becomes a 500 million dollar multi billion dollar market. Timing, I mentioned it earlier, but timing is one of the sort of underappreciated things, both as an entrepreneur and as an investor, because I have seen so many interesting companies get started, but before their time. And then a few years later, the same idea with a different team comes along and it's successful and you wonder why. And it, it's, it's just because there's market dynamics that just come to play and sometimes, you know, great ideas just are not going to hit, hit the sweet spot. Yeah, question? Yeah, how do you assess that? <laughs> it's hard. How do you think about it? It's hard. I mean, you know, I guess I would say... I think you don't know until you try, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to overcommit and spend a lot of money until you sort of see that you are you have the right time. A lot of it is market risk. You know, that, so a lot of investors will tell you there's four kinds of risk. There's product risk, there's market risk, there's financial risk, and there's um, team risk. Um, the institutional investor capitalists like Kleiner would tell you, don't worry about the financial risk. We have enough money or we can help you raise money. Team risk, we can help you mediate because we can help you hire people or whatever. Product risk, we're willing to take product risk. That's what we do. The big question is market risk. And so what you want to do is you want to shake that down, shake that out as early in your process as possible. And you know, now that I work with angels, uh, you know, with, with entrepreneurs and angel investing, I, my whole, my, what I preach to them is, look, um, we don't know if this product's going to work. We don't know if the time is right, whatever. But as long as we don't over-invest, both in terms of sweat equity and in terms of money, um, we will either get a, a modicum of a return. I'll, I'll, someone will buy it for something, or we'll bail and we'll feel okay about it. So at any point of, as sort of you go into it, you kind of have to realize that you don't always know the answers, but if you, if you kind of scale your investment according to the data you get back, you feel okay with it. Um, competition obviously is, it, is Low competition is one of the things that is attractive for a new business, but, and sort of this kind of goes with my comments about the five forces, there usually is no competition at the beginning. So it really, you know, the question about competition more has to do with barriers that we're going to talk about also. Um, and then here's the last thing that I, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure this is sort of traditional or, you know, accepted wisdom, but as an investor, one of the things I really appreciate is what I call contrarian bets. Because to me, you know, risk, uh, reward goes with risk. And if it's obvious, if it's, if, if it's obvious what to do, if the business ideas are obvious, if the product idea, you know, is obvious, the customer need is obvious, there's probably not a lot of upside in that. I mean, even if you come across it first, someone's going to come across it soon thereafter or probably at the same time. So to me, I think sometimes the best bets, not always, but sometimes the best bets are the ones that don't seem obvious. In fact, later on, people are like, oh, yeah, that's obvious. But they were not obvious at the time. And you get to remember, if it was that obvious, it would have been done before. So I think, I think the idea that, 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 you know, things that don't seem obvious and might seem really out of left field, don't ignore them. Now, I'm not saying they're all right. But, but there's, I think, a way as an entrepreneur and as an investor to think about those in a way that I think potentially... Um, that's the good, good, good outcomes. So here's a question for you guys. Is this, I don't know if this used to be a $64,000 question, but now it's maybe a $64 million or a billion dollar question. Um, which wins? A poor market with a great team or a great market with a poor team? So who wants to vote for a poor market with a great team wins? Uh, you know, a poor market beats a great team. Yeah. Oh, well, hands in the air. Let's see. Who wants to choose the first option? Okay. Everybody. So how, how many people want to want to choose the latter? Maybe maybe it's not. It's a divided crowd. So I don't know what the again what the accepted wisdom is for this. I think a lot of people in the investing business in Silicon Valley would tell you, "Great team." I'm here to tell you, not true. <laughs> Great market. <laughs> I have seen unbelievable teams. Great team, go after a bad market. You, you, 
cannot overcome a bad market. I'm not saying you will fail every time, but you will not get a, you know you will not get the best you know the kind of outcome you're looking for. You'll 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 fiddle around. You'll maybe get something out of it. But you know, but I've also seen very weak teams participate in just astounding market growth and have great successes. So I would argue, you know, you want to have a great team. There's and there's no reason not to have a great team. But make sure you're participating in a great market opportunity. Yeah. How else would you describe a great market aside from the fact that it's big? Growing fast. Starting small, we're going to grow fast. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's that's. Well, I mean, then there's middle business model questions. Can you extract? I mean, these five forces things. Can you extract enough margin? Yeah. Is there competition? Are there substitutes? But again, at the beginning, those things almost you don't really have them very very often. So. But you know, so, something that you can make reasonable margins on that's going to grow fast, that you can be the leader in, you almost always can make money. I have to say that. I mean, you can screw it up executionally, but I've even seen poor execution and still make unbelievable amounts of money because they participated at the right time in a really high growth, growth market. So here, here's my view. And I actually, I did this particularly this way, because I want to point out to you that my view as an institutional venture capitalist was quite different than it is, not quite different, somewhat different as an angel, and would be different if I was an entrepreneur. And I think this is, you should be really mindful of this. So when I was at VC, part of what you have to do there is, you know, you, you have a certain number of investments you have to make to fill out your fund, and you have a, you know, you can only sit on so many boards. So you have some economic constraints, but the, the bottom line is that you know, you have to find a market that's going to be grow, grow, and be very big. And you, you almost always have to bet on something that's clever and big at the same time. I mean, that's kind of just the nature of the, of the game. Um, so that's kind of what you look for. And you watch out that you're not investing too early. That's this idea of, you know, you kind of, you, you want to shake out the market risk before you pour lots of money. But, you know, as an angel investor, I, don't, I have different constraints. I can put less money in, I don't have to get on the board, I don't have to answer limited partners and so forth. So I have a slightly different you know, view of opportunities. Um, I still want something clever, but it could be medium-sized. It doesn't have to be giant. Um, I really want something capital efficient, because I don't have a fund of you know, 600 million or a billion dollars to invest. I actually like things that are contrarian ideas. And I, this is going to sound blasphemous, and I, and I don't want to be sounding negative of institutional venture capitalists like my firm, because I think they're great, Kleiner's great, they're all great, but I think they often bet less on contrarian ideas. I think it's hard, at the, certainly in, until there's evidence. <coughs> Most institutional investors, remember there's a whole bunch of, ta of people around the table, they all have to sort of agree, I mean, that's kind of, and the nature of that is, it's very hard to get them to all agree on a contrarian idea. If I see something that I like, I don't need to ask him. I, even if it's the most contrarian thing, I say, I'm in. So I, I actually like contrarian ideas, and I think a lot of times institutional investors actually leave contrarian ideas to people like me until they're proven, and then they invest in them, and they're not so contrarian anymore. But that means I get great returns. Yeah? Can you give a couple of examples of what you're referring to as contrarian ideas? Uh, sure. Let's see. What would be a good one? Um, Let me think about that, and I'll give you some that you know. I mean, I know this in my mind, but you might not know them. But I'll, I'll come up with a couple that you'll, you'll know. Um, and then the last thing I care about a lot is a scrappy, coachable team. Because when I get in, I don't, you know, I don't have the luxury of saying, you know, I, I'm going to write you a three or five million dollar check, and we'll be able to go hire like a name brand CEO. I need entrepreneurs that are going to be on the job, and they're going to be effective. And two. I want them to be really scrappy because we don't have a lot of money. So, again, you know, my view has changed a little bit um, when I think about opportunities um, based on what my lens is. And I think, again, as an entrepreneur, and this is how you should think about it, too. I mean, and this sort of sort of cycles back to what we said at the very beginning. You know, what what outcome are you looking for? If you want to shoot to the moon, and you know, you know, you probably need something that has like an unbelievable innovation or maybe a, a wildly contrarian idea. But maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you want something that you can sell for a reasonable amount of money. That was one of my choices on my possible outcomes. And you know what? 
for that, you probably don't need to have a wildly contrarian idea. Um, and in fact, you probably don't want a wildly contrarian idea, you know, you know if, if you want something that's of, of medium size in terms of an outcome. Yeah. Th there you go. My main question is next. So what is medium size? Take the quotes off that. What is medium size? With well, and, and I guess, yeah, and what I'm talking here is, um, again, it's a little bit of, of what the what the lens is of an institutional investor in the first thing and then the second one for me. But, you know, generally speaking, if you sell a company for anything over $100 million, that's, that's an unbelievable outcome in, in most circles. But frankly, as a venture capitalist, that's too small. You know, as a venture capitalist in the, in the Valley or anywhere, they want multi-hundred million dollar exits. So, you know, you said, but, you know, what I tell my entrepreneurs when I invest in now as an angel, say, hey, look, if we, we measure our, our capital in, you know, and it's measured in the hundreds of thousands, or maybe one single-digit millions, or maybe you know, two, you know, two-digit millions over multiple years. We can sell the company for 25, or 50, or even 15, and be happy at some point along the way. That's the kind of mentality when I talk about a medium-sized outcome. Now, again, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so I've got other slides to talk about, sort of, um, kind of other aspects of this, but I thought I would just take a break here. We covered a lot of stuff about, you know, thinking about evaluating these opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities. So, questions at this point? You know, if none, we can, we can keep going and spend some more time. How do VCs um, tend to evaluate companies whose main motivation isn't uh, making as much money as possible? They don't. It's not on their screen. So, the earlier when you were talking about nonprofits and kind of the social impact, these Nope. Now, there are other sources of capital for that. Um, there's increasingly family foundations. There are some specific venture funds that have been set up for that, like kind of local one, frankly. But 99% of the venture capitalists, and all of them that you've probably ever heard of, not, would not pass those things. Yeah? How do you evaluate the market growth? And, I mean, currently you hear about renewable energy, healthcare, and so on. but Sometimes you just want to make a list of different markets that you can think of. How do you go about evaluating its potential growth in the next half decade or decade? Yeah, so one of the very next things we're going to talk about right here is, is um, become an expert in developing the idea. And that's where this comes out. Because, you know, there's like big trends that anybody can cite, like, you know, healthcare reform. But what does that mean? You re if you want to really look at a specific opportunity, you have to become a super expert on that. Everything about it, who the customer is, who, what the potential alternatives are, what you're going to bring to the market. And that's what we do in this class that, that I teach here, is that the whole first semester where we do viability research, that's what we're going to talk about next after developing the idea is, you know, I don't, I, nobody knows for sure what the outcome of any given market growth is going to look like, but I know there's a set of questions I'm going to ask for you as an entrepreneur, and you need to have credible answers. If you don't, then you've not passed my screen as being an expert in the area that, that you're, you're trying to build a business. So there's no, there's no, and there's no substitute for field work. There's no substitute for talking to people. Again, that's what we teach in this semester, first semester of the class that I teach here. You know, you got to go out, you got to talk to experts, you got to talk to people who've tried it and failed, you got to talk to people who, you know, are the customers or potential customers. That's that's where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. As an angel investor, do you have to have a clear expectation on the exit strategy when you when you invest in you? That's a great question. So um, my answer is some. What what I do, and I said this earlier, what I the conversation I have with my entrepreneurs is not that hey, you know, I'm only investing if we sell the company for a fifty million dollars. Because, you know, frankly, we don't know. In fact, you know, my attitude is, like, I'm, I'm, my attitude about investing is um, every startup is a novel. And when you first write that first check or the entrepreneur puts their first sweat equity in, it's, it's not even the prologue. It's like, it's, like the, it's like the first letter on the cover of a book. I mean, the book has so long to get written. So I don't want to prejudge the outcomes. I don't even want to limit the outcomes. Um, I was at, a, like, this big... Um, angel meeting recently, and there's a guy who's a big angel investor from Canada, Basil Peters, interesting guy, smart. And his whole thing is, angels are making a mistake. They should talk to the entrepreneurs before they put a dime in any of these companies and set 
exactly you know, how many years it's going to be to exit and sort of what the time frame and, the, and how we're going to get to an exit and even a little bit what the range of the valuation is going to be. I, I, I love the guy and I give him a lot of credit. When I went after him, I thought that was nonsense. You know, how would you know? I mean, if I knew right now that the company only worth X in two years, I, I probably wouldn't invest. I mean, you're, you're looking for the upside. I mean, at least that's my, and, and the entrepreneur too. So I don't like to try to breach, prejudge the outcomes. But the conversation I do want to have is that we're going to stepwise mitigate risk and take capital only to the extent that we see the opportunity. And this is where I think experience comes in. I think this is where um, the clear view of day judgment comes in. I mean, I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't like entrepreneurs that get all rosy colored glasses. I think that's a mistake. I think it's too easy to be, you know, judge the eventual outcome by my first 10 customers or, you know, look my first two months, I've got like 5,000 registered users. I mean, you know, we, we invested in Friendster and it had, you know, 4 million users and 100,000 registrations like a week. Well, we did not make any money on that investment, you know. And Twitter's got whatever, you know, 100 million people using the amount. I'm not sure those investors are going to make money. So, I think you've got to, I mean, and who knows, I mean, I, I, those are two extreme cases, but I, what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm, way to, I'm happy to go along for the ride, but before we commit ourselves, and the big commitment for these companies is taking lots of capital. That's the big fork in the road. Once you take it, you can't go back. So before you make those decisions, in the light color of day, with, with the sun shining on all the data, we're going to sit down and really make sure we want to kind of commit ourselves to the next week. And as long as the entrepreneur says, yeah, I get it, I'll be happy to sell it for $20 million. I'll be happy to sell it for $300 million to, and, and take the extra risk to make it if we agree that that's what we should do. I'm good with that. Yeah. Somebody's been both the venture capital and the Can you maybe talk a little bit about some of the non-monetary uh, assets that uh, these types of investors bring to the table? Because it's beyond the block that they Which, particularly venture capital investors? Venture capital and angels. Like, what else does they bring to the table? Oh, yeah. Well, so, for example, this whole idea of, you know, experience about judgment about the size of the opportunity, the opportunity is working or not. I mean, I've seen a lot of startups now. I've invested in a lot, but I've actually seen my partners invest. My team, I mean, I've been an active participant in the venture industry now for 15 years. And you do get a, a good sense of, of a lot. So I think there's just a lot of company building experience and how these market evolves and market, market dynamics evolve that I think is valuable. Network. I mean, you bring a network of people, you know, recruiters, potential people you hire, advisors, board members, investors, I mean, you do all that. Um, you know, everything from reviewing operating plans, I mean, I do all of that with my team. Okay. And is that true for both VCs and angels? Is there any kind of difference? Uh, there's no answer to that. It, every individual is different, you know, and, and what I tell people who, I, it just, just blows me away. One of the things that, you know, they tell, we, we tell entrepreneurs um, and you know, it's probably sort of standard operating behavior that you check out entrepreneurs, like you call references. You know, they know they're going to do that on you. They give you the reference almost the first time you meet them. But how often do they reference check you? I say to my entrepreneurs, look, you should not take a dime from me unless you reference check. Here's, here's my reference. But it just blows me away that so few entrepreneurs do it. So you definitely want to know who your investors are. And they're not on some, you know, pedestal that you, you know, can't reach up and find out who they are. I mean, you should, and, but so few people do it, actually. Yeah? Question. Um, so, as a community, these effective or angels, where do you guys, do you guys ever go and look for opportunities with companies, or is it always that you're approached by companies, and then how, how do, uh, What's the organization or structure that has to set up that allows, you know, say, a garage start to go in and seek out an angel investor or a venture? Yeah, it's all over the map. So most institutional venture capitalists spend a lot of time reaching out. Um, some of them actively look at certain sectors. They, you know, acquire, we have these um, off-sites every year where we sort of said, hey, we want to invest in this sector and this sector, and we somehow would have associates go out and find everyone. And other venture firms do that differently. But, yeah, they do a lot of outreach. That said, some of the best deals were just inbound deals that we didn't know anything about or industry we didn't know anything about. 
Um, as angels, it's different. I don't have any paid employees. I don't have to invest in every deal. In fact, I don't invest in most of the deals. So I, I, I sort of pick and choose, and I decide what I want. So, but, you know, and some firms do, some VC firms do a lot more outreach than others, and some angels do. I mean, I know, like, a, some of my friends who are sort of full-time angels, and they have raisable funds to do angel funding. They actually go to conferences. They put a big shingle out saying, oh, I'm here for seed money. I don't do that. But some people do. And, and every firm has a different process. Most, most, most firms these days have a process by which you can submit something electronically. And you know, when I first got into business, that actually was not very often the case, but they all have it now. So the other hand, follow-up question is, say you did submit something electronically and it was just an idea, and it was kind of like, you know, at first it didn't seem like, maybe like, for instance, your contrarian idea, where at first it didn't seem very obvious, but then all of a sudden it became very obvious and then there, as a VC, you say you have your network and you have your ability to bring in the team. Why don't we take this idea and just build a team around it? And why do we have to go with this, you know, this person's idea? Or whatever? Well, so a couple things about that. One is that almost never happens. That's, that's not that's not the business of venture capital. We invest in people and their ideas, not like, hey, I, I want to steal an idea. I mean, what's the benefit of that? There's really actually a lot of disadvantages, disadvantages and no advantages. But I think probably more importantly, one of the things we sort of teach students in my class is um, write in a compelling executive summary that piques the interest of a venture capital sort of investor so that he or she takes a meeting. That's, that's the goal of the summary, not to explain everything. And that gets to the second question, well, when eventually you do want to explain everything, is that okay? And my attitude is people typically way too overvalue their ideas. I mean, there are some ideas that are better than others, but even then, I mean, communicating it to a, an investor is typically not the end of the world. I mean, you can keep something in reserve, there can be some secret sauce, there's still some, some lot of executional stuff you have to do. So, I guess my point is, my, I, I would tend to favor over-communication. Not talk to everybody, that, that's, that's, by the way, don't mischaracterize, I don't like deals that get shopped everywhere. There's no point, if, 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 if somebody wants to talk to everybody, you know, like meeting every investor on the Hill, I think that's a mistake. There's no benefit to that. I think what you should do is have a rightful approach where you, you target the top five investors who know something about what you're doing. You somehow get into them, either by sending them really compelling exact summaries or getting sort of soft introductions from somebody who they know that you know. You get in front of them and you compel one of them to invest. That's the way it works. I mean, that's the way it should work. It doesn't always work that way, but that's the best way. We're spending a lot of time tomorrow talking about funding. Um, I want to make sure we okay. through the evaluating part because pretty much all day tomorrow, all morning tomorrow is about funding options. So. Well, I'll go through this quickly um, in the next really five minutes, and we'll have another ten minutes of questions. Okay? So uh, I already talked about some of this, but you know the idea can come from lots of places. It can come from you know your business experience, your personal experience, research you do. It could be even I. I've even heard of projects that, that, you know, I heard a colleague say X, and then I checked it out. So it can come from a lot, or, or it can come from something I even mentioned here. But the point of it is, when you're done, you're an expert. I mean, not when you're done, even before you present it to somebody, you're an expert. You do field research, you challenge yourself, and you let advisors and, you know, people who you, you know, let in on the idea. So does it really make sense? And you morph it and change it as necessary. But, you know, I want to, I can't emphasize enough, you have to be I think people underestimate that being an entrepreneur is being, you know, in complete command of every aspect of starting your business. Every aspect. The, the really good entrepreneurs, they can talk to you all day long about any aspect of your of, of, of your business. Any aspect. Now, I'm not saying you have to be able to write code and be a great marketing wizard, but anything fundamental about the business that is relevant to an investor, you're going to have a good answer. Um, one of the things you do is you, and this is again the first semester of the class we teach here. Uh, they have to know too. They have to know. Is you become an expert by going out and actually doing research. You um, you, know, you validate and, and hone the business concept. You test key assumptions. You go out in the field. You can do this again. I said earlier by talking to experts, doing uh, customer uh, uh, research. You know all the things you can do to kind of identify, characterize, and come up with mitigation strategies for all, all the key risks. Um, you know, a 
lot of what you need to do is basically field research. And it comes in all kinds of you know, ways, but basically you have to get data. The data, you always sort of start with, with the premise, and then the data that you get adds credibility and evidence. That's the thing that I think separates the really good plans and the really good entrepreneurs. A lot of good entrepreneurs have an idea, an interesting idea, but the ones that are really compelling, they have so much evidence that they've brought to the table, either by talking to customers or talking to experts, or you know, there's so many ways to kind of create the credibility around your idea. And that's where the research comes in. Um, lots of stuff, but I guess, and I, I, I think this comes a little bit from, from, from what I see in the class, but I think it's true for a lot of entrepreneurs too. The failure mode is to say, I need some money to test it out. Or I need, you know, I need six months to test it out. And that's the failure mode. You know, wait, guess, hope. You know, the real entrepreneurs, they figure out the cheapest, simplest way to kind of get something out, and they start getting data. And they morph it. Specifically, uh, there's a concept you may have heard in, in sort of the, that's in the internet sort of space called the minimum viable product, the so-called MVP. And it's so different than when I got in the venture business. When I got in the venture business, a team would come in and they would say, I need $5 million or I need $3 million. And what we're going to do is we're going to hire six engineers or 20 engineers. It's going to take us a year and a half. And we're going to have this beta product. And then after that, we're going to have six months of beta testing. And then we're going to launch it. It's going to have all these features. And they draw it off on the whiteboard. This day and age, nobody gets a check rate like that. What I, what I see now and what I do as an angel investor is I want to know just the very few minimal features that you need to excite some customer response. It may have nothing to do with revenue. It may have nothing to do with the final product. I mean, nothing to do with It may have a very small subset of functionality of the final product. But what I want to see is I want to see the dog eat the dog food, the smallest amount of money going in. And you as an entrepreneur should sort of want to do that with the least amount of sweat equity going in. That kind of gets to the topic we, we talked about earlier, which is you want to mitigate the risk. You want to see that you can actually get something going before you make a lot, of, a big commitment. And so that's where I sort of say to me, and that's that's easy to think about maybe in sort of the, in the internet world, but I think it, it, this lesson sort of applies to most businesses. Trying to get something out to see that the, that the and mitigate the market risk, see that there is market reception. That's the success mode. The failure mode is to think that by doing lots of preparation and lots of work and lots of formulation that, you know, someday in the future will mitigate the market risk. Now, I'll, to be clear, not, not every company and not every product can go with only $100,000 to see if it works. I, I, you know, for sure, you know, a lot of companies require a lot more money to develop their products before they can get anything back. But even, uh, what I'm talking about is the scale. Whatever the scale is, the minimum viable product is, so it might be $100,000, it could be a million, it could be 10 million, it could be 100 million. Finders invest in some energy products where they have to build a hundred million dollar plant before they know that it works. I don't like that kind of investment, but you know, but whatever that minimum is, don't spend a dime more than the minimum. So then you've got this refinement loop. You know, you do your early assessment of the customer need and the market size, you build this minimum viable product or prototype, you assess what the hidden factors are, then you go out and you test. And you do your primary research, you see if 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 the Dogs are eating the dog food. You kind of assess all that, um, and as necessary, you revise and morph again. Mm -hmm. And again, some of the best entrepreneurs, you know, they're, the final product or service is so different, or even the business model is so different than what they came in, and that's just their natural process of evolution. Um, I, and again, I, I think this this loop idea of refinement is really sort of the seminal thing that entrepreneurs do well. They are constantly assessing where they are, what data they need, and sort of feeding that back in to improve the, 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 uh, the opportunity set and also specifically the outcome. I think that's my last slide, yeah. So questions about anything we've talked about? Phase it in according to the data you get. So initially, it could be during.
dirty and cheap. That's what we sort of tell people in our class and in the real world. But if that looks good and you get some initial funding to get going and you build an MVP or some prototype, then you can do more formal work. Um, so I guess the more rigorous and the broader, the better. But don't think that you have to wait around and start getting data. In other words, don't think you have to raise money. Like that's my last, my last uh, preaching. I don't like people who come and say, I don't know anything about this, but if you give me $100,000, I'll run this task. <laughs> no thank you. you know, do whatever task you can with whatever money and sweat equity you can put in. Just show me some indication that it makes sense. Then we can talk about how much money I can give you to run the next task. But don't start by saying, you know, I need something to do some task. I think entrepreneurs, again, you know, I like scrappy entrepreneurs, but all good entrepreneurs have to start with nothing. And they, Good ones go a long way, even from some market research. But I'm not afraid of non-formal market research, not at all. Mm -hmm. all right. You've been doing some you know, customer feedback sessions with your like, and having your customers feedback. Have you found that that has Top three, what I would ask you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, dude, well, is this guy real or not? Is he it, you know, it's interesting because it's not specific, it's not general. It's very specific to the business. Okay. I mean, I'm, what I really, I want to sort of hear three things. I want to hear that you, you've done your homework and that you're an expert. And so I might ask you a lot of, not even arcane questions, but, you know, very detailed questions. Like, okay, because I want to know, that you, you really think this through? The second thing I do is I actually do look at a financial set financial slide or set of slides. And people say, why do you do that? It's like, it's never going to be right. And it's true, it's never going to be correct. But the reason I do that is because it, un it, it uncovers a set of assumptions that you have decided on or, or maybe haven't. And I want to know what they are. I want to see how you thought about it. And the third thing is, I want to talk to some experts. And this is, you know, the diligence part of it. I mean, I want you to tell me, who should I talk to that this, this is real and this is going to work the way you think? Because if I find someone who knows better than, and you haven't talked to that person, shame on you. You need to know everything about this. And that means every expert that should know about it. So those are the kind of things I triangulate on. But it really very specific to the idea. I would 
disagree with you. I yeah. think, particularly in the internet, consumer internet, as I was talking with Laura, I, I don't think talking to customers is very valuable. And I think talking to experts is very valuable. So for example, there's a team in my class right now that are trying, is trying to do something, it's not identical at all, but it has some similarities with Mint. And they went and talked to the entrepreneur from Mint, and it got a slew of information about how they launched it, how they got free PR, what their business modeling was, was, and not only what their model was, but what if the model was right and wrong. That's invaluable. So when I say experts, I don't mean like, like some research person. I mean someone who's actually tried to do something similar. I, last year, I had a team that was trying to do a photo, consumer photo thing, and I said, you know, I know this has been tried before. Go find one or two of the people who tried it and failed, because I knew they failed. And they did, and it was unbelievable how much they found it. It didn't stop them. I mean, by the way, Again, I don't think you should be dissuaded because people fail. They could have failed because of bad execution. They could have been failed because it was the wrong time. You know, so you need, but you need to understand why they failed. I mean, you can't just say, yeah, we're not quite sure why they failed, but we'll succeed this time. You know? but, but I think that, when I say that, so I say experts and quotes, but those kind of interviews are where they're weak. Not much, right? Because if it's a market that an analyst has already studied, it's probably already well understood and not like a real startup market. I mean, real startup market, there's no analyst who's already studied it. In fact, nobody would, and the reason I know that is because no one would have paid for it and the analyst would not have studied it. You know, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Well, I mean, we in the cosmetics industry, which is... Just... Well, yeah, but, but the question is, you know, how, how does the general, so like, so that's an established industry and there's people cover it. But how relevant are the, the statistics or the, the, the work that they've done to your product? Yeah. I don't know. You know so that, that's the question. I mean, like, I remember um, I'm in an internet ticketing business. And around the time that I invested, I looked for a report on internet ticketing. It's like five, six years ago. And there was none. And I called up Forrester that typically does this. And they're like, well, you know, it's all done on eBay. And it's not a real market yet. So we're, we're not planning a market yet. I was like, ah, oh, that's interesting. They, they see it's happening out there, but they don't think it's organized enough for them to invest. And I said, okay, I want to find one to invest in. So I did. But, you know, so I guess what I would say is my view is typically if it's, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't invalidate the research. But typically if it's really well laid out like, like analysts do, then it's like, what am I investing in? You know, I, I, I typically want to invest before there's a market that you now, again, in your, your project, it might be a little different, but most of the times when I invest, there's no good analyst report. Carolyn? Um, as an investor, and you've done this for a very long time, what are the, what are the exciting things that you're, you're seeing at the moment? What are the trends in the last sort of year or so that, that you're really jazzed about? Well, you know, that's hard to say, but, um, you know, there are still a lot of people in the venture industry who are excited about sort of the clean tech stuff. There's still a lot of stuff going on there. Um, there's a fair amount in, you know, what I would call internetish stuff, but mostly around social media. You know, social gaming, Facebook. I mean, these companies have had an explosive growth. There's a lot of interest in that. Now, I don't know if anybody's going to make more money in that than Facebook's already made or will make, or Zynga's already made. But, you know, there's a lot of people fishing around in that pot. Um, and then, I, you know, I think there's a fair amount of stuff uh, in the medical device and medical health services stuff as well, but that's not an area I, I look at. But I, I hear from my friends that, that there's still a lot of stuff going on there. Um, you talked about being early to the market, but how do you evaluate if an idea is too late to a market? So if you see an idea and you're just like, it's a great idea, but it's too late, how do you tell that? That's a great question. Because, um, like, for example, most people would have said, don't invest in Google. There's already five search companies. And this is where it kind of comes to the cleverness of the idea and where the innovation comes from, or maybe how contrarian it is. In other words, the contrarian idea, I mean, there are a lot of contrarian ideas at Google, but one of the contrarian ideas was, we're not going to clutter up our home page. We're not going to put ads, which was the you know, primary revenue source of all of these existing, was putting big, you know, mini-pixel ads on the front page. And the Google founder's like, we're never going to do that. 
that screws up the user experience. Now that's a contrarian idea. And it sounds subtle, but it wasn't, it wasn't obvious. It, 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 it sounds obvious in respect, but it was very subtle at the time. So I don't think there's anything wrong with being like a follower, but you really have to have the conviction of your contrarian or innovation, you know, contrarian idea or your innovation. And sometimes it's hard to get funding for those, but sometimes they can be fabulously successful. Okay, no more, or you want to quit? I just have one quick one. Yeah. If you um, if you were going to recommend one book, like, what would be what's your favorite book that an entrepreneur huh. should should be reading? Thanks for having all me. your years. You know, My favorite book. Favorite book about entrepreneurship per se, huh? or or angel investing if that's the sort of perspective from the lens. But you know, I'm going to have to think about that. But I I, I will. Let me know. I will let you know and you can send them an email. The, as a, I've never been asked that question, actually. And to be honest with you, I don't think there's many good books I've ever read about entrepreneurship. Very few. I'm, I'm, there's probably one I can think of if I think hard about it. But, and I owe you an answer, too. Like, give you a, So what would be a contrarian? That, well, so there, there was one right there. Um, Google saying, we're not going to run ads on our home page. That was a contrarian idea that, frankly, a lot of people thought we're crazy. I'm not going to name who was on that first board meeting when the founders told the investors that that's not what they were going to do. But some very experienced venture capitalists thought that was crazy. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you, Russ, for doing that. Thank you.